Bienvenidos, Ushamdi, and welcome to this HUD-8 networking tutorial on the ASA firewall basic configuration tasks to get you up and running if you were in a small office, home office, maybe a small business, and we're actually walking through all of the different steps that would be required to get you to the point where you're actually going to be able to have port forwarding, you're going to have remote access VPN, uh, and you're going to be able to set everything up that you would need to uh, in order to use this ASA in a production environment. And so this module, module number seven, we're going to be focusing on access control. In other words, the access rules, which is in the ASA parlance, how they refer to ACLs, which are basically then applied to ASA interfaces, with the access group command. So very similar uh, to the way that you would create an ACL and then apply that ACL along with its access control entries or ACEs to an interface. We do the same thing here, but the ASA likes to call it access rules. And so you'll see that when we get into the GUI that it actually calls out access rules. So let's go ahead and dive in here. And I want to start with a brief review of the modular policy framework because these two features with the ASA, the modular policy framework or MPF along with the access rules are inextricably linked to each other. They are tightly coupled, they work hand in hand. And so as a brief review, we remember from the previous module, module six, that the ASA is a stateful packet filtering device, as opposed to just simply a packet filtering device, right? That stateful keyword is in play. And so what is it that makes the ASA stateful? Well, it's the fact that it's inspecting the traffic and that traffic that is being inspected, right? Or matched for inspection, is having connection objects created in the connection table or the state table. And we saw that by default, TCP and UDP are getting inspected. And TCP in and of itself is already stateful, right? We've got the SYN for the synchronize, that three-way handshake, the SYN, SYN, ACK, ACK. And then you've got the sequence numbers that are going back and forth. Now, UDP is not stateful, but the ASA firewall is configured to treat it as a stateful protocol, right? So it's tracking that source and destination IP address information along with the port information. Even though there are no sequence numbers going back and forth, it makes it so that it's got connection objects in that state table, that connection table. Remember, the connection and the state table are synonymous. And that is how the ASA is stateful, right? And we saw that in terms of the order of operations, remember, that the first thing the ASA is looking at when a packet shows up on an interface of the ASA is it's going to check first, do I already have an existing connection object in the state table for this flow or this conversation or flow and conversation I'm going to use uh, synonymously, right? So for the flow, do I have a connection object and am I expecting a packet to come back in and does it have the right sequence number, so forth and so on, in the connection table? And if it does, then that packet is allowed to come back in. And to really uh, briefly draw up what we saw and what I will demonstrate here right now, is remember we had the ASA here with the outside interface connected to the ISP router. The ISP router is running HTTP, right? And we're going to connect to it right now. And then we've got this, uh, unfortunately, it's that tiny little MacBook Pro, but the web browser is a little bigger, so it's not too bad. And this is my inside interface. And we saw the default 
implicit rules, right? The rules that say for the inside interface with a security level of 100 permit any traffic from anybody over here on my LAN segment or anybody that sits over on this side of the security of the interface in this security zone or security level 100 permit all outgoing and let me make that green right there <clears throat> excuse me permit all and we'll call it outbound right all out bound because it's going from a higher level security zone to a lower level security zone so they refer to that as outbound right and don't confuse the traffic flow description with the application of the ACL. The ACL is applied inbound in for the inbound direction. Again, we're talking about the default implicit ACLs that are out there for us. And so outbound traffic flow, right, is allowed by default and it hits the ISP, but here's the question. Traffic is now going to flow back for that HTTP session, right? With the HTTP information, and it's gonna hit this outside interface. And we saw that with a security level of zero that there is no implicit rule because you can't go to a lower level security interface than zero. So there is no implicit rule. So it falls, and let me change colors again, it falls to what? You've got it. It falls to that global ACL, which says what? And remember, global in the sense that this ACL is applied to every interface. It's there for every interface, right? To all interfaces on the ASA. And it basically says, deny any, any. And so we have right here a deny any, any. So how is it possible that the return traffic makes it back through that interface right there, all the way back over here to the web browser? Exactly. It's the stateful nature of the ASA firewall. And so, again, it's going to be the state table, the connection table, which is examined first. If, the, if there's not an existing co uh, connection object in the connection table, then the ACLs will be evaluated to determine whether or not that first packet and only that first packet, is it going for that conversation? Does it qualify, right? Does it pass the ACL test so that a connection object can be created? And so that is the role. That's where the ACLs come into play is they basically allow the creation of a flow or conversation, or they'll deny the creation of a flow or conversation, whether it's permitted or denied, the traffic is permitted or denied, but it's based off that first packet that's coming through, right? That's the only packet that's really evaluated by the ACL, and we just talk through the scenario where that's the case. So let's do this. Let's go ahead and pull up our VNC viewer here. You can see that uh, my IP, what's my IP? 100010, right? I've got my default gateway as the ASA. It's my layer three device. Here I am in my web browser. I can't go to Google because this ASA is not really plugged into the internet. Uh, do I have connectivity? I do, right? I'm directly plugged into the ASA firewall. So let's do this. 10.0, oh, sorry, not 10.0.0. Let's go to 209.165.200.254. This is the IP address for the ISP router. And take a look at that. So we're being prompted right now. I'm going to say Travis is the username. Cisco is the password. And there you go. And this is concrete proof that right now, we, we have the default configuration right now. And it's the modular policy framework. It's the inspection. 
inspection of TCP, right? Port 80, HTTP falls under TCP. And since TCP is inspected by default, take a look at what's happening, right? It allows the connection to come back because if it was the ACL that was being evaluated first, this would not work. This simply would not work. Now, remember, we said that once you start changing from the default, and that's what we're going to be examining here, is when you start applying your own ACLs, right? What ends up happening? So the ACLs are evaluated for the first packet in the new flow. There, and this is very important, right? When we're talking about the access rules, whether it's the default access rules or your custom, you know, we're going to do some custom ones here, right? We're going to create an ACL called inside. We're going to create an ACL called outside. We'll create one called DMZ. And we'll uh, do a dash and we'll put the direction, whether it's inbound or outbound. So remember that when we talk about the access rules that are being applied to a firewall, it's for transit traffic only. In other words, it's for traffic, and here's how we define transit with the ASA. It's for traffic that's going to come in to one interface on the ASA and then exit out another interface on the ASA. In other words, it's for traffic that's going to both ingress into the ASA and then egress out another interface on the ASA. That is transit traffic. Transit traffic is not traffic that is terminating at the ASA. And so what kind of traffic would that be? Well, remember, we have an ACL right now on the outside interface. And I'll, let me pull up, uh, let's pull up the, this is a good time, we'll go to configuration, we'll go to firewall, and here are my implicit rules. And again, the configuration, I haven't made any changes to our configuration from module six, right? So there's that bogus DMZ interface that we created just to see that we would get an implicit incoming rule because the security level is 50. So any traffic from the DMZ can go to any less secure network for right now because we're still dealing with the default implicit rules. In other words, the rules that have been provided to us by the ASA. And so the outside interface has no implicit incoming rules, which means that it will fall to the global implicit rule, which is just think of the global implicit, implicit rule as being appended. Yeah, it's appended, not prepended. It's appended at the end. It's appended at the end of the DMZ implicit rule, the inside implicit rule, the outside, uh, the outside, there is no implicit rule, but it's still appended to the outside uh, interface evaluation, right? So the global implicit rule, which right here is any, any, and we're going to talk about why you would want to change this, right? Maybe you want to add something to this global implicit rule. So it's basically, this is your deny any, any that we typically talk about in the terms of an iOS ACL, right? Like the other day we did permit, I think, well, I can't remember what we did. We just permit, and I think it was a, a layer three, and it was just the source address of, you know, 200, uh, what was it, 209, 200.0 slash 24, right? And at the end of that, there's an implicit deny any, okay? And the same is true with these default access rules, right? And you can see here, this is what I, you know, they call them access rules, right? This is just the ASA way of saying these are the ACLs that are applied to interfaces. And we can actually, like I said, customize and create our own, which we will do. And so if it's deny any on the outside interface, how is it possible then that from the ISP router, I can say, what was the password? Cisco? There we go. I can ping 209.165.200.252, or not 252, sorry, control shift six, or is it 252? 
Let me check real quickly here. Show IP address. I can't remember the IP address we had. 52, sorry. 52. I'll say 52. Well, that's interesting, right? So I have a deny any statement on the outside interface of the ACL, yet I can, I'm sorry, on, uh, the, uh, we, have a, uh, we have a deny any uh, on the outside interface of the ASA, so how is it possible that I can ping the ASA? Because it's deny any on that outside interface. Exactly, right? This ping is destined to whom? Where is this ping going? Yeah, it's terminating on the ASA. It doesn't meet the definition of transit traffic because it might be ingressing, right? It might be entering one of the interfaces on the ASA. But remember, our definition is that it has to both enter an interface on the ASA and then exit out another different interface on the ASA. Does this meet that requirement? It doesn't. And so this goes to prove that the access rules are specific to transit traffic. In other words, traffic that is destined to the ASA is not impacted by the access rules. And we need to make sure that we're aware of that. And so let's test. If I can ping the ASA, if I was to create a static NAT definition, and let's do this. So we're going to create an object, and I'm going to do it for the MacBook that's on the inside. Let's create a static NAT. So I'm going to say uh, object network, and we'll just call it MacBook. And I'll say MacBook-68 because the IP ends last octet is 68. And we'll go ahead and say host is uh, 10. Or actually, what? Oh, you know what? Uh, I'm thinking of the <laughs> my local LAN. We'll leave the 68 on there. It doesn't matter. But it's not 192.168.1.68. It's going to be 10.0.0.10, right? That's the IP address, the inside RFC 1918 private IP address. And so now let's create a static rule from inside to outside. And we'll say static, and I'll give it the 209.165.200.10, right? That seems fitting. We'll match it the last octet 10 to 10, even though I've got a little senior moment there by putting 68 in there. All right, so now we've got this static NAT definition defined. Do we still have, let's take a look, in our show run policy map, policy map. Do we have ICMP in here? We do. So I should be able to say ping 209.165.200.5, uh, not 52, 254. Can I ping the ISP router? Absolutely I can. And what is happening here? Again, right? We've got to understand that, and this is the default is I've got this MacBook over here, it pings. The ping packet shows up here on the inside interface and what does it evaluate first? Does it look at the ACL that says, oh yeah, all traffic from a lower interface uh, or a higher interface can go to a lower level security interface and that's what I'm gonna check first? No. It checks to see, is there a connection object in the connection table, in the ASA. Do I have any stateful information on the ASA that already exists for what's going to be this conversation? And the answer is no. So one, we check the state table for connection objects, right? And I'll put state TBL. So obviously the ICMP packet, which ICMP is not stateful, right? There's nothing stateful about ICMP. So then I do check the ACL on the inside interface in the inbound direction because this is inbound from the interface perspective. Now remember, don't confuse the flow of traffic definition based on 
higher level to lower level, which we refer to as outbound. Don't confuse the traffic flow definition with the flow of traffic into the interface, right? This would be an inbound ACL, and here's what we could say. This inbound ACL on the inside interface is evaluating the outbound flow of traffic from the inside zone to the outside zone. Right, and that's a true statement given the definitions that we have defined. And again, it's not me defining it, right? These these exist, right? And these are the terms that people use. It's so it's the outbound flow of traffic from the inside zone to the outside zone is being evaluated on the inside interface by the inbound ACL. Right? So it, then it checks the ACL, and the ACL says, yeah, I, well, I allow all outbound traffic because right now everything is the default, so we're good to go, right? This is going to work like a champ. So then when the traffic goes to come back, right, even though I said ICMP is not stateful, right, by default it's not. But that inspect statement that we put here, right, the ASA is now awaiting an echo reply to come back from the destination IP address that it put the entry in the connection table for, which was the 209.165.200.254. Uh, and so when the echo reply hits the outside interface with a deny any any, what happens? Yeah, it doesn't look at the it doesn't look at the ACL, the 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 um the outside uh, interface ACL, which is there is no implicit ACL, so it falls to the global. It doesn't look at that, right? The first thing that it looks at, or I should say it doesn't look at it first, the first thing it looks at is it looks to check to see is there a connection object in the state table, i.e. the connection table on the ASA. If there is, the traffic is allowed to flow back through. So now we've created this static NAT, and we just saw that outbound, it works great. Now, remember, the reason that you would want to do the inspect ICMP in this scenario and not throw ACLs onto the interfaces is because of security, basically, right? I mean, let's, let's be honest, that there's all kinds of attacks that can be launched with ICMP packets. And so by using the inspect ICMP, what I'm saying is I'm doing a one for one, right? So an echo request goes out and the ASA is simply waiting for a single echo reply to come back for this conversation, right? This flow between the MacBook and the ISP router. And that protects the firewall, right? Because it's not, because if an ICMP packet came in from the ISP router, let's say the ISP router tries to do a denial, a denial of service attack against the ASA. If I have an ACL on the outside interface that says permit uh, any ICMP or permit ICMP any, you know, into my inside zone, I'm opening myself up for a world of trouble, Right. I don't want an ACL that's going to allow anything on the internet to be pinging through to anything at once, right? I want one-for-one -one inspection, and that is what this Inspect ICMP gives me, right? This is the advantage of that, and this is a best practice when we're talking about ICMP. The best practice is use the modular policy framework, set it to inspect ICMP, because then the only inbound ICMP you're going to get coming back from the outside, you know, the internet, that outside interface, would be for an ICMP packet that we generated on the inside. And that protects you. So uh, we've created this object here. We've got the static NAT statement set up. So let's prove this. So here we are back over here. What if I was to say ping 209.165.200. And I've already forgot that I put 10. I think I went with 10. Yes. 200.10. 
And what's happening here? Right, so these are ICMP packets that are showing up. This is inbound traffic from a flow, right? From the traffic flow perspective, right? It's outbound from higher to lower. In this case, we're doing inbound because B-O-U-N-D. Boy, sorry about that. That's a U. We're doing inbound because it's coming from a lower level security interface to a higher level security interface. Now, is that allowed by default? No. And we specifically know that it's not allowed here. But here's what's happening. So the ISP router, which we just generated these five ping packets, sends the ping packets and they get to this interface. And what is the first thing that interface on the ASA, that outside interface, what is it going to look at? Exactly. It's going to look to see, do I have an existing connection object in the connection slash state table for this traffic? And what's the answer going to be? Absolutely no, right? No, that nothing exists because these are the initial ping packets. And the, you know, again, the first packet is that initial ping packet. So there's no existing information. Then what gets done? Exactly. Now we look at the ACL, the outside interface, because it's security level zero, has no implicit ACL by default. So then it falls down to the global, which kindly says what? Not so much, right? Deny any, any. And so why do you think those ping packets are being dropped? Exactly, because they're being denied by the global default ACL that's part of that set of implicit, right? And that global, you can just say that that is implicit. I think the GUI even says it's implicit. Again, that is going to be appended at the end of all of the interface ACLs that exist or the access rules that exist for each of those interfaces. So this is why I can ping outbound and I can't ping inbound. And so again, I definitely wanted to do a solid review of the modular policy framework because this is again one of the concepts I remember when I was trying to sort this out and, and wrap my head around it, and it caused all kinds of confusion in part, and again, I don't want to blame the guy who was explaining it to me, but the guy that was teaching me just told me straight up, oh yeah, you can go from a higher level interface to a lower level interface by default. And we had inbound ACLs on all interfaces on our PIX firewalls. And I couldn't figure out why is it that I can't go from the higher to the lower in a lot of instances, right? And again, now we transition into that conversation. So we're going to be a little unorthodox here. So we've got, and I guess what we'll do is we'll permit HTTP. So here's what I'm going to do. So now I'm going to prove to you because this is a very, very, and we've made some changes. I'll say refresh and actually wants me to log back in again. So you can see where we've got the one implicit incoming rule for the DMZ, which again, that implicit rule is just basically I can go from any higher level interface goes to a lower level. All traffic is allowed. Inside the same, yeah, and it does say implicit here for the global, right? And remember, the global's appended to everybody. So let's do this first. So let's say, and we're gonna pretend here for a second, that the MacBook, let's pretend that that's a web server, right? Now, it's not in the DMZ, okay, granted, it's in the inside zone, but it, this is still going to prove the point, is let's say that it's a web server. Well, how would I allow hosts on the internet to access HTTP? How would you do that? Yeah, you would have to have an incoming uh, or an inbound rule, right, and, or in the inbound direction, I should say, an access rule on the outside interface that would allow 
that traffic to come in, right? Because the web server, which is serving content, is not going out and establishing connections with users, right? It's the, just the opposite. The user on the outside is trying to connect into your network, right? To get that www, that HTTP access. So here's where, okay, let's go ahead and create an ACL. So not on the ISP router. Got to be careful there. So here we are, right? And let's go ahead and say access list. And this is a naming convention I like. Outside dash and then the directionality of the ACL. In other words, outside in, if it's going to be applied in the inbound direction on the outside interface and outside out, if it was, excuse me, to be applied in the outbound direction on the outside interface. And I'm actually going to, there's a, there's a very um, good practice if you're, you know, blacklisting sites uh, or IPs that you can do by applying an outbound ACL, or I should say an ACL in the outbound direction on the outside interface. And I'll talk about that in a little bit, but let's, let's work this first. So, I'm going to say access list outside, whoops, in, and we'll do caps, extended, and then what is it that we want to do? And take a look, right? We can permit or deny. So I'll say permit, and what do we want to permit? Well, HTTP, that's TCP, and I'm going to say from, and remember, this is a rule, and let's say, you know, that I've got a, uh, a hot website that gives you all kinds of uh, hints and tips and tricks on Cisco. So anybody on the internet is going to be connecting in. So I would say from any source to what? Yeah. So now here's, and this is another you know, quick sidebar here, is what IP address, if I'm putting an IP address in, because I haven't created an object, and in all reality, I would, and in fact, you can use the object name. I should probably, you know, use the object name because I did create the object. I was thinking it was a fictitious web server, but we've already created the object. So I could say object, and then I could put in MacBook-68. But that brings up the question, right? Is the MacBook-68, what IP would that be referencing? Is it referencing the static NATed IP? Or is it referencing the RFC 1918 private 10.0.0.10 .0 .0 .10 IP address? And this was another, this is another change uh, in the code. And again, if you're beyond 8.4 code, then you don't need to worry uh, about some of the legacy things that were going on. But it used to be that you would reference, in some cases, the translated the natted, or I should say the nat address, right? So you would put in 209.165.200.10, but you don't need to do that anymore, right? You're going to use the private address because the nat, in terms of order of operations, it will do the natting, then it's going to look to see, okay, where is this going on the interface on my firewall, right on the inside interface. Oh, it's 10.0.0.10. So let's do this. We'll say object. And this is, again, a great benefit of having the objects if you've got a solid naming convention. And we just put the name in, which was MacBook-68, which we did by default. And I'm saying TCP, but remember, TCP only equal to HTTP. HTTP. So there it is. So show access list. Now, in and of itself, and oh, TCP any host, I'm wondering. Oh, I'm sorry. Trans I thought we had two rules. I was looking at this. I was like, why are there two rules in here? I thought I had another rule that was in here. But it basically translates. You see what it's doing here? It's translating this rule for us. So it doubled the lines, right? But that's okay because it gives us a look and we can see what's going on. And 
we're line number one, right? This is the first rule that we've entered in. The name of the ACL is outside in. Now, could I have done this in the GUI? Yeah, sure, I could have done it in the GUI, but then I'd end up with outside, and it's some sort of a default name. It's like outside underscore access underscore in or something like that. I want my own name here. <laughs> I want outside dash in, something that is going to be my naming convention throughout the application in the configuration of all my ACL. So outside dash in. So now when I go into interface VLAN and we are, I believe it's, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, we don't need to do that. So access group and uh, what are we gonna do here? The specified name of the ACL. So this is outside dash in and then I think we have to do the interface. Oh, the direction. It's in the inbound direction, which is why we named it outside dash in, and then the interface, which is outside. Now, as soon as I hit enter here, I'm going to go back over to the ASDM, which is going to be begging me to refresh things because he has sensed that there was a change in the configuration. And now this implicit, aha, so it's not zero implicit rules. Now it's one incoming rule, and take a look. It's permit HTTP. But, you know, the MacBook is not running an HTTP server, unfortunately, so we can't test that. But let me ask you this. What could we test that a minute ago was not working? Exactly. Because if I'm telling you the truth, this should then work. And what do I need to do? All I need to say is access list, outside dash in, extended, and I can put a line number in here now. Actually, I could have done it before to put it in if I wanted it to be number three or number 99 or whatever. So outside in, extended, we're going to permit ICMP from any, and let's use the object again. We'll say MacBook dash 68, right? Now, I can log this information, right, if I wanted to. I could trim it down so that it's echo reply and or just the echo, but or I can just hit enter. And then it's going to be all ICMP traffic is going to be allowed from any host on the internet, right? And this is why you don't want to do this. This is why you want to let the inspection work because you don't want unknown nodes on the internet having ping capabilities to hosts on the inside of your network, right? Not a good idea. And so we're just doing this to prove that, okay, this is going to work. So now that I've got the ACL created and the access group applied to the interface that's referencing this access rule, which again is nothing more than an extended ACL with access control entries, when I say show access list outside dash in. And I'm going to make sure we get capital I in in there. So again, you can see it does that translation for us. But here is the ACL. So let's go ahead now. Can I ping now? Ha ha ha. We can ping now. So what happened? The first ICMP, well, and it's going to be one for one. So every single ICMP packet that is showing up, the ASA on that outside interface is looking at the outside in, right? That inbound ACL for inbound. It's checking traffic that's coming into the interface, right? It's checking every ICMP packet to see, is there a connection object? Do I have information in the state table? No, I don't. I need to go to the ACL. And then it references that ACL. And now, before it gets to the global deny any any, we snuck a permit statement in here, right? So that's good news. Now, when we talk about doing this on an on and it, it's a it's I don't want to say it's a best practice. It's a very common practice. And I I would I'll go ahead and make the leap. It's a best practice, and it's probably the most common practice with the ASA firewall to have inbound ACLs on every single interface. And the reason for that is that it guarantees that the traffic is going to be inspected one time, 
right? It's going to be inspected one time. Because if I go back over here to my host, right, is this still working? Let's do a quick refresh here. So I'll click refresh. Right, let me see the diagnostic. So there's the diagnostic log, right? We'll go home, show tech support. Right, it's pretty convenient, right? So you can see that we still have HTTP access, right? Because remember, the inside interface has not had a non-implicit, in other words, an explicit access rule applied. So it's still, right, the inside interface is still saying, hey, as far as I know, all traffic from a lower level security, or from a higher level security interface can go to lower level security interfaces. And we're about to change that. So are the pings working? Yeah, the pings are going to work because, again, we haven't applied any, excuse me, anything to the inside interface. So let's change that. And again, this is a very common and a best practice is on every interface you have on your ASA is to create access rules because you want to do what they refer to. And this is, a, it's, this is another, again, another common term, minimum access right? So that you're only allowing the access that's needed. And that, again, and that's a, in a production environment, that is a best practice, the most common way to deploy your ASA in terms of applying access rules to the interfaces. And so here's what I would do, because again, I want to lock things down. So let's say access list. And again, inside dash in. Even though when we refer to the traffic, it's outbound traffic because it's going from a higher level security interface to a lower level security interface. But we apply it to the traffic coming in to the interface. From the interface's perspective, this is inbound to me. I'm the inside interface and the hosts behind my interface are sending it inbound to me. So access list inside in extended and what did I miss? Access list. Oh. Am I in? Oh, where am I? At? Oh, I'm on the ISP route. I'm like, wait a second. I'm not missing anything there. All right. So back here on the ASA, let's go ahead and say access list inside dash in extended, and I'm going to permit ICMP any, any. So as soon as I apply this ACL, we're about to see once again that it this is going to break that default behavior on the ASA that says all traffic from a higher level security interface can go to a lower level security interface. And we're going to break HTTP specifically, right? Because as soon as I put this on, this is the only rule. So only ICMP is going to be allowed into that inside interface from the MacBook. So we should lose the HTTP connectivity. And I may have to clear the connection table, and we'll talk about that in a second, because is state information going to exist right now for that HTTP session? It might. Let's check it out here. Let's see what happens. So let's go ahead and say access group. Um, inside in, and in the inbound direction on interface inside. Right now, as soon as I do that, let me come back over here and let's see what happens now when I go home. Yeah, didn't even have to clear the connection table for that one. It may, the ASA may have done it internally on its own because now we've got HTTP traffic showing up here. And let's see, maybe it's just that it's HTTP, right? Is this not going to work for me? I hit enter. We've got nothing, right? And so this conclusively proves for you the statements that I was making in Module 6, as well as this module, with respect to those default implicit rules. And the statement is, is that once you apply explicit rules to an interface on the ASA, 
those that implicit rule in the statement that you can make where you can say, oh yeah, all traffic from a higher level security zone is allowed by default to go to a lower level security zone. Now we need to add on if and only if you have not applied access rules to those interfaces on the ASA. And you just saw it here. But let's check. Let's say ping. Can I still ping 209.165.200. Uh, what is that? 254. Yeah, you bet. Ping is working. What about in the other direction? Should this still work? Yeah, we're going to have to get a ping 209.165.200.10. Bingo. Right? It still works. Because remember how we're doing this. We have inbound ACLs on the interfaces. So from the interfaces perspective, and there you go. We're allowing HTTP through, which again, I apologize, I don't have an HTTP server running on the MacBook, but we've got ping, right? Ping is going to work. So we've got two incoming rules. And remember, it's incoming because it's traffic that's originating out here somewhere, right? We just call that ISP. But all traffic coming in from the internet is coming inbound to that interface. What confuses a lot of students is they'll say, oh, well, it's inbound here, but then it's, it's coming inbound here. No, th that's not right, right? That's not correct. Don't look at it like that, right? It's in to the interface, right? Into the interface. Once it's in the ASA, it's not going inside from, or it's not going inbound from the inside interface to the outbound, right? It's not coming inbound this direction. This would be considered outbound because it's from that interface's perspective, okay? So remember that. So we're doing inbound ACLs right now or access rules, I should say, to be correct. And then here's our any, any for ICMP, for IPv4. And take a look at that. We've even registered some hits here. Uh, no hits here. Although, did we ping? I can't remember if we pinged out or not. And so again, this is nice, right? You know, it's going to show you, hey, that's your top 10. You've got three hits or however many hits you've got. And then we've still got this global rule here. So let's talk about this global rule for a second and what makes sense if we were to make a change to it. And it's simple to make a change to it, especially, and I'll tell you what, we'll do this in the GUI. So if I click on the global rule, all I have to do is come up here and say, add access rule. Interface, right, I get to pick what interface do I want to apply this rule to. So we're in the global, right, which would mean what? any. Do we leave it at any? Yeah, we leave it at any. So I'm going to permit from any source, right? Uh, and we'll say going any direction. I'm not going to do IP. I'm going to do specifically TCP. Well, actually, we won't do that TCP. Let's get back up here. And so here's kind of what you would use this global rule for or some or some ideas as to what you would use it for. First and foremost, what if you're doing NTP and you want to use the NIST servers, right? And I want all of my security zones to have access to get to the NTP servers. So what a great idea to put it here in global. Because if I didn't put it in global, what would I have to do? Yeah, exactly. I would have to go to every single interface on the ASA. I would have to create an access rule, or I should say an access control entry to put in my ACL, which is my access rule, to allow into that interface, right, the inside interface, the DMZ interface. Maybe I've got a, you know, a partner interface, a, a DMZ2 interface. On all of those interfaces, I'd have to go create an ACL that says, yeah, allow NTP traffic to come through this interface. Why not put it in the global rule? Because remember, the global rule is appended 
to the end of all of these rules. So let's well, I tell you what, we'll do this here. Let's say um, to any, from any, and I'm going to change it. We're going to make it ICMP, something that we can test, and ICMP. And we'll say, OK. We'll let it log, and we'll say, OK. Now, you can see that the order of the rules is important, right? We want this to be first, or else what? It would get denied, right? So we want it to appear first. And then we're going to make a change. I'm going to come here, and I'm going to delete that rule. So we're going to delete that ICMP rule, and we're going to delete that ICMP rule. Now, remember, on the outside interface, we still have this HTTP only. And uh, the inside interface, we've got nothing, right? And maybe I'll go, I'll go put something on the inside interface manually. So I'm going to click Apply. So we've got our outside. We've got our global rules here. Let's come back over here, right? So ping should work. So from the ISP, can I ping 209.165.200.10? I can. And why can I do that? Because of this any any that is applied to every interface. And so let's do um, from the opposite direction here. Let's go from the, whoops. And we should actually be able to see this. The pings, let me do a control C. Let's make sure that we don't have anything funky going on here. And that's actually the wrong IP. Uh, can I ping 209.165.200.254? And there you have it. So again, I, I did something that we could test to prove that that is the functionality of the global rule. Now, you would probably never do it with ICMP, but NTP, yeah. Yeah, sure, you could do it with NTP. What if you've got an external, what if your mail server is external? And you want to make sure that all of the hosts in the different uh, security zones can get to that SMTP server for whatever reason. Yeah, you could put a global rule in here. And this is perfectly fine, right? So, but I'm going to go ahead and pull that out right now. And you can see, oh, and you know what? I should have talked about that. So you see how the inside in the DMZ had the implicit incoming rules. Let me let me back. Ah, not back that way. Sorry. We'll apply the changes. So you see how they have the implicit incoming rule. When I added that ICMP rule to the global access rule, what happened to inside and DMZ? Yeah, they disappeared. Because at that point, and this is actually a, a very key point that I was going to overlook here, but I'm glad that that happened. So as soon as you apply any rule to the global access rule set, the implicit rules for all interfaces are gone, right? So two important things, and this is going to be a nice segue back to the deck. So remember that all ACLs that are applied to the interfaces are extended ACLs. You cannot apply a standard ACL to an interface in an access rule. They're all extended. Remember, standard ACLs, and we'll get a look at it when we do split tunneling with the VPN, that is where you would see a standard ACL. You can create standard ACLs. You just can't apply them to the ASA interfaces. So beyond the default access rules, we took a look at ICMP. We did HTTP. We did all kinds of cool stuff. And you can create your own access rules, the global ACL. And so a point that needs to be driven home here is there's two things that are going to break that default behavior that allows you to say, oh, yeah, all traffic from a higher level security zone is allowed to go into a lower level security zone. And I haven't applied any ACLs, right? Two things will break that. The first is you apply your ACLs, or even if you were to go into the GUI, you could uh, use what they provide for you here, right? You could click on inside and click add, add access rule. And you can see since I highlighted inside it, you know, pick for me the inside interface, and then I could do my rule here, right? As soon as I do that, the inside interface no longer respects that default behavior of allowing all traffic from the inside, which is 100 security level, 
to any lower level security interface. I just broke it. So there's two ways to break it. This is one way. Put an ACL on the interface other than an implicit, so you explicitly define it, or you explicitly put a rule in the global access rule. Those two things will immediately stop that default behavior. And again, in a production environment, that is what you're going to be doing. You're going to be creating ACLs, or I keep saying ACLs, I should say access rule to be correct. You're going to be creating access rules, right, that contain access lists, that contain access control entries. And you're going to be applying those with that access group command in order to control minimum access, because that is what you want, right? That is what you want. Now, the final thing uh, that I'm going to talk about after, since we talked about the, uh, the global rule, was we talked about inbound, right? And that's the common, the most common, and I'm going to stretch it and say the best practice is on an ASA, every interface has an inbound ACL, ensuring that the traffic is inspected at least, uh, or only one time, right? On that inbound connection, it's going to be uh, evaluated. And so the question may come up, well, when would you do outbound? Or is there a use case for outbound? And there absolutely uh, is a use case for outbound. And this is what that use case would be. If you're blacklisting, right, if you're trying to protect yourself, there's bad actors that are out there on the internet, right? And so you want to protect yourself from their traffic getting in to your network. And so typically what you would do is on your ASA, right? Again, the most common best practice is you've got ACL, I was just saying access rule, I apologize. You got an access rule, which is an ACL here on this outside interface that is only allowing in what traffic you want to allow in, okay? Um, and so why would you do an ACL in the outbound direction? Well, let's just, I'm going to use, we're going to say it's just going to be X, right? Host or node X, and this is the bad guy, right? And the bad guy out here on the internet is trying to get access. And, you know, maybe it's your IPS or your IDS or your logs are telling you that he's coming from IP, and I'm just going to say A.B.C.D. And so what you do is you come to the outside interface, and the very first rule, typically you create object groups and things like that, and, um, and you would put these bad actors and list them inside of the object um, group, create objects for them and put them in an object group. Uh, so, but what you would do is you would make sure that the very first ACL line that is evaluated on this outside interface in the inbound direction is a deny of that IP address. Right, And again, we're dealing with a single IP here, so we're trying to keep it simple. So you're dealing with this bad actor. Now, the other thing that you would want to do is do an ACL in the outbound direction that is also the very first thing it does is deny outbound traffic to ABCD. And you're probably saying, well, ah, why would you do that? I don't get that. Because if you're blocking them inbound, how would they ever go outbound? Well, remember, and in my production environment, we actually have 11 different security zones, 11 interfaces that go to 11 different zones. And so you've got a lot of stuff going on there. And if one of those zones is a partner zone, and let's say maybe you let partners connect in here. And they, you know, they've got a T1 connection and maybe they've got a router sitting over here. Who's to say that their router doesn't get compromised and then traffic, you know, this bad guy compromises their router and now he's running that way. And he's launching attacks from the inside of your network, right? And maybe he's trying to get back to his ABCD, 
Okay, so that is why you would want to deny traffic because if he exploits something here and then tries to get back to his node, man, you want to see that. You definitely want to know that if you're blacklisting an address, a host, whatever the case, a subnet, whatever the case may be, if you're blacklisting that traffic inbound, you should not see that traffic exiting your network out, or you should not see traffic exiting your network outbound going to that bad guy, right? That is of major concern, major concern. But again, it drives home the use case of an, an ACL being applied in the outbound direction on that outside interface, is block the traffic coming in, but also block the traffic going back to this guy outbound. Make sure that he doesn't weasel his way in here some other way and then try to get back out to his network. You do not want that to happen. All right, so as a review, let's recap here. We talked about a lot. We did a review of the modular policy framework. We know TCP and UDP are inspected by default. We know we can pull in ICMP with that inspect command inside the policy map under the class statement, right? When do the ACLs get evaluated? They get evaluated if and only if it is the initial packet of a flow. Because by definition, if it's the first packet of a flow, it's not going to have a connection object in the connection table. And remember, the connection table and the state table, synonymous, same thing. Remember that the ASAs, uh, or I'm sorry, the ACLs applied to the ASA interfaces are extended ACLs, and that the ACLs that you are applying, and we prove this in this video this evening, in this tutorial, that the flow, it's about the flow or the conversation that is transiting the ASA. Connections that are terminating and destined to the ASA to terminate at the firewall are not impacted by the access rules that we apply to the ASA interfaces. And again, we're not going to be talking about management ACLs. That's something else, but that's a way that you can control that, and you certainly want to look at doing that. But with what we're talking about here, these ACLs are not impacting traffic destined to the firewall. It's impacting transit traffic going into an interface on the, a on the ASA and then exiting another interface on the ASA. And then we went into the ACLs, right? We created our own access rules. We took another look at the outside, inside, DMZ, implicit, and I should, there's no implicit on the outside. So the implicit on the inside and the DMZ, the fact that there's no implicit on the outside so that it falls to the global. We looked at the global ACL. We saw how you can actually use that to your advantage. In an environment with 11 zones, and they all need to get NTP information from the NIST time servers, great way to take advantage of that global ACL. And we saw that as soon as I did that to that global ACL, that the two interfaces with implicit rules disappeared from the GUI because at that point, they no longer have implicit rules. And those are the two ways that you can break the ASA default behavior. Right out of the box, we've got the modular policy framework. It's inspecting TCP and UDP. I plug it in. I can connect to the internet. And I can surf web pages. I can do all kinds of great stuff. Because at that point, with a default configuration with no access rules other than the implicit, and then the outside without the implicit, other than that, there's no access rules. So all traffic from a higher level security zone is allowed to go into a lower level security zone. That's permitted. As soon as you change any of those interfaces with that have implicit rules, as and um, yeah, that have the implicit rules, the outside is not going to count so much, right? Because it's already deny any. There's no implicit rule there. So as soon as you change any of the interfaces with an implicit rule, including the global interface, that breaks this statement right down here. This statement is no longer true for that interface. And most common best practice with the ASA, 
especially in a production environment, probably not your home environment, but in a production environment, get an inbound ACL on every single interface and provide minimum access, only the access that's required. That is the way to do it. All right. So we are through probably the most difficult and confusing part of the ASA, right, at the introductory level, the modular policy framework and then the access rules and how those are going to play with each other. And so I really hope that you've got a much better understanding as to how they're linked together, how the ACLs and the MPF work, or I say the access rules and the MPF work together, right? And the little intricacies, right? The semantics of, well, what happens if I put my own on there? All right, this wraps up Module 7. Now it's on to Module 8, which I think is AAA and DHCP, because we're going to get DHCP set up on the inside network. So that 10.0.0 slash 24, we're going to get DHCP set up there. And I hope to see you in Module 8. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for watching.